Hi, uh, thanks for coming. Uh, it's a bit out of the way, so you made the effort to learn Elixir. <laughs> Good on you. <laughs> uh, my name is Jae Jun. Um, I'm going to talk about Phoenix. So a quick show of hands, who has heard of Phoenix? Just heard of. Okay, almost all. Uh, how many people are using Phoenix in production? Okay. So last week, uh, there was about 30 people and less than 10 put up their hands. So not many. <laughs> so I suggested that I knew that we need an introductory talk to Phoenix um, because most people are curious and they don't know um, what they're dealing with. Um, if you've never heard of Phoenix, it's a web framework written in Elixir. Um, I would say it's the web framework for Elixir. Uh, but talking about web frameworks on strange new stacks is normally not that interesting. Uh, because most just clone Sinatra or even Rails, uh, and they don't introduce anything new except the fact that it's written in you know language X. You know, uh, thankfully Phoenix is not one of these frameworks. Uh, so the title is not an accident. Uh, I deliberately picked uh, real time, real time web apps uh, for this reason. Um, although Phoenix is a top notch uh, general purpose web framework, um, I wish to focus on where Phoenix uh, really shines, uh, where I think it's above any other stack. So some say the future of web is real time, uh, in which case this talk should be titled you know, Modern Web Apps with Phoenix. Um, I'm not bold enough to make that claim, but some are. So let's start by introducing a stack. Uh, as mentioned, uh, it's a web framework within a lecture. Um, and um, it also runs on the beam. Um, most stacks you say, oh, it's Ruby on Rails, you know, or it's, you know, um, Django um, written in Python. Um, but with Phoenix, uh, you have to be very conscious of the fact that that's the Erlang powering it. Why? Uh, because what's interesting is that the top two are comparatively new. Uh, Phoenix 1.0 was released two and a half years ago in 2015. That's really, really recent. Uh, and Elixir reached 1.0 a year before that. Now in consumer technology terms, that's the Apple Watch, which came out two and a half years ago. And that's the iPhone 6, which is the first iPhone with two sizes. And Erlang came from the mid 80s. This is the Mobira CDMan 900. It's actually Nokia's very first mobile phone. Right? To put it into perspective, um, if you think Java is old, uh, Java was released in the mid 90s, and Erlang predates Java by 10 years. Now, it's no accident that uh, Elixir syntax borrows heavily from Ruby, for those who know what Elixir looks like, uh, because its creator, uh, Jose Valen, was part of the Rails core team. Um, and Phoenix 2, uh, by extension, was heavily inspired by Rails. Its creator, uh, Chris McCord, um, was you know, an avid uh, Rails user. So both Creators of Elixir and Phoenix obviously liked uh, Ruby on Rails. So why did they choose to create a new stack uh, on top of this uh, dinosaur ancient platform? You know, there must be something really special about Erlang. So the most famous, uh, famous large-scale deployment of Erlang is WhatsApp. Uh, back in 2012, they got a lot of attention after publishing a blog post that they are supporting 2 million live TCP connections on a single node, a single server. That's two million smartphones connected to one server, you know, chatting to each other. And their words, even with plenty of CPU and memory to spare and do it sustainably. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, uh, CPU usage was hovering around 40%. Um, it was a big server, like 24 CPUs uh, and, and 96 gig of RAM, um, but still an impressive uh, figure on any stack. Uh, some more interesting stats, if, as if that wasn't crazy enough. Um, in 2015, they could manage almost a billion WhatsApp users with just 50 engineers. And this was after Facebook bought them, right? So they had all the resources in the world to hire more engineers, uh, but that's all they needed. Um, to give you an idea of the load, uh, WhatsApp users today send 60 million messages a day to each other. Uh, that's three times the amount of SMS, SMSs uh, sent globally 
uh, in total per day. So around this time, uh, Chris McCord, the creator of Phoenix, um, was running into some deep problems trying to solve uh, around concurrent uh, connections in Ruby. And he heard about WhatsApp. Uh, I went searching for the secret sauce, you know, and found it was all powered by Erlang. Uh, WhatsApp's choice isn't an accident. Um, Erlang was invented by Ericsson for telecom, um, specifically to build telephone switches initially. So if you're building a telecom company or telecom startup, you, know, uh, you don't have to build it in Erlang, but you should take a hard look in building it in Erlang. So Chris got super excited and started looking to Erlang. And being a Rubyist, he was disappointed to discover that the Ruby mindset, you know, the excellent tooling, get up and running quickly, productive quickly, uh, wasn't there. In fact, he found it difficult to even get started in Erlang. But he found some great things. It's been around since 1986. Uh, that's older than the Linux kernel itself. And Erlang also handled half of all telecom traffic in the world. So if you're using a phone anywhere in the world, there's a 50% chance it's going through an Erlang system. You know, that's a lot of traffic um, handled successfully over the years. Um, in fact, some systems have reported nine nines of reliability. So they're out there, some Erlang server running somewhere for years and years and years and years um, with essentially no downtime. Uh, but fortunately, the developer experience wasn't there. Um, then Chris discovered Elixir, and he remembers uh, Jose, this is the creator of Elixir, announcing it back in 2011, and he thought it was crazy, and, and, and Chris ignored him. Uh, but now that he's looking to Erlang, oh, maybe Elixir is worth another look. Uh, so J Jose is famous in the Rails community. Uh, he was part of the Rails core team, and he wrote Device, which is the most popular uh, user authentication library for Rails. And this guy, Jose Wallen, created this new language called Elixir, right? And Chris liked what he saw, which is basically taking over spiritually what's best about Ruby and bringing them over to Erlang. The focus on tooling, elegant syntax, um, and take advantage of all Erlang has to offer. Then Chris McCord created Phoenix to solve his problems. And it, in his words, it's a framework to take on the modern web. And the modern web includes uh, HTML5 apps, JSON API backends, distributed systems. And because it's written in Elixir, you get beautiful syntax, uh, productive tooling, but also a very fast, very reliable runtime. All right. The Rails community has always pitched that though Rails is slower, productivity has always outweighed performance. Uh, how often do you need Twitter scale, right? How many projects even remotely reach Twitter scale? Uh, but issues do crop up at smaller scales. Uh, he had a project where the app had to call out to seven, seven different APIs, and the user visited after being away uh, even more. So he had to spawn a new sidekick worker for each call in this, in this app, uh, uh, which is a ton of workers. Uh. So something that is not computationally very hard uh, ended up being very expensive to run. Uh, with Alexia and Phoenix, you no longer have to make this decision. Right? You can get both productivity and performance. The focus is on productivity, but you get performance and reliability from the Erlang runtime. All right. So what can I build with it? So um, you can think of it like a Rails clone. Uh, so you can do your normal stateless apps, your CRUD apps, your REST APIs. They're all there. Um, but uh, you can also do stateful apps uh, and like I said earlier, uh, I think this is where Phoenix actually shines. Let's uh, focus a bit on uh, stateless. What do I mean by stateless? So if you send a HTTP request, um, the server analyzes requests, forms a response. The request contains everything you need to build the response. All right, uh, the HTTP method you use, the cookies, the path. So this architecture is great, and it allows the web to scale because you can keep adding servers. All, right, uh, all each server has to do is just analyze its requests, um, irrespective of what came before or after, all right, to form the request that the client needs. Um, you can hit one server and one request, and the next request you hit a completely different server uh, that you get load balance to, and it doesn't matter. So Phoenix is an MVC framework, um, heavily inspired by, as popularized by Rails, standard stuff nowadays. 
Um, but with stateful services, you open a session between the client and server, and they talk to each other on an event-driven basis. Um, events can originate from the client, get pushed out to the server, or some event happens in the server, and the client needs to be notified. Now, this communication is bi-directional and can happen at any time. So while MVC is a great abstraction for stateless architectures, um, is it a good fit for stateful ones? So Phoenix introduces a new abstraction called channels. And you can think of it like controllers in MVC, uh, but real-time controllers for stateful apps. Um, every client subscribes to something called topics. Um, you can think of them like virtual rooms. So once you join a room, you can send any message to it and the server will be listening. So a room is uh, it's just a string, uh, as you can see here. Um, the server also keeps track of which, subs, uh, which clients are subscribed to which uh, topic. And when any client or the server sends a message to that topic, everyone subscribed to that topic uh, will receive that message. So on the left is the topic, and the right we call the subtopic. And this is how routing looks like for channels. Again, this is a little bit different from uh, your, your controllers in MVC. Um, this is Elixir code. It's the first time I'm showing it here. Um, as you can tell, um, so the topic is room and the subtopic is everything related to this topic. Uh, it's handled by the room channel module, which is the third, well, the second argument to this macro. I will explain what's macro later. And that's it. Um, this is the client. And this is JavaScript. Um, you create a socket object, which represents a WebSocket connection in this instance. And you join the channel with uh, the room lobby topic. Uh, after joining the channel, you can push any message to the server. And it's pushing a uh, new message, the new message message, um, message to room lobby. But it can be anything. It could be add command. You know, so when you enter something, uh, you can send whenever you have uh, finished entering that uh, value. And you can um, also subscribe to different messages. Uh, depending on who has joined the topic, um, for example, you can listen in on new comments. So whenever people uh, public broadcast new comment, you will receive it on the client. Back to the server, uh, this is the module for the socket that I mentioned earlier that you can join. Um, as you can see, it's listening to all rooms as I mentioned. And there's also a connect function here in case you want to process socket joins uh, for validation, for example, you know, whether you allow that client to join that socket. And here's the proper channel code. And like socket, um, there's also a function called join, which allows you to do certain pre-processing even. So if previously you don't allow people to jo join your socket, um, then it's either yes or no there, right? But after they join the socket, maybe you only want to allow them to join certain topics. Uh, and that's where you control it using the join method here. You know, for example, you can join the lobby. They can, cannot join another room which is private, you know, room colon one or something. Handle in is the handlers for incoming messages. Um, and this is the handler for add comment. As you can see, every time the client sends an add comment message, this handler extracts the comment and broadcasts a new comment message. So let me repeat that. So you're handling a message, incoming message, that's an add comment, incoming message. And you decide to handle it, you broadcast another message called new command. And everyone subscribed to new command will receive this message. And that's it. That's all you need to do to add real-time features to your application. So one of the primary goals of Phoenix, uh, Chris said, was to add um, real-time, to make real-time web programming as easy as adding a REST endpoint. Um, I think he successfully did it here. So, 
Channels are not just for browsers. In fact, it's client agnostic. There's a spec there's a, that you can write channels on any platform, and as long as you conform to the spec, you can talk to Phoenix uh, on the back end. So there are clients for iOS and Android out there uh, used in production now. <coughs> uh, channels are also transport agnostic, and what I mean is, um, earlier I showed an example of Phoenix socket join, and that's WebSockets, which is a default and a sensible default for bidirectional communications. Um, but if that's not available, um, say <coughs> you're using IE <coughs> 9, um, you can fall back on long polling, and everything just works as far as the developer is concerned. So here you have a bunch of devices connecting to your server, uh, but what if you have more than one server? All right, we're talking about stateful services and persistent connections. Uh, it's important to know which server is talking to which client. All right. So Phoenix builds upon Erlang's built-in distribution uh, features to provide synchronization. I'll elaborate on that later. Uh, but every time a message is sent, Phoenix knows exactly which server to send it for handling. So it seems like magic, but remember that uh, Erlang was originally created for telephones. So just by substituting some name and icons, you can see it's just a bunch of phones connected to telephone switches um, across the world. Yeah. It's the exact same concurrency model that Erlang was designed for, and it's the exact same problem faced by the modern web. So here's a little bit peeking under the hood. Uh, so what happens is when a client connects to an Erlang process, um, oh, when a client connects to a Phoenix, an Erlang process is spawned, that's the green circle over there. All right. uh, it's an Erlang process, it's not an OS process. Um, like OS processes, um, Erlang processes are isolated and they run concurrently. They don't share memory with other processes. And you need mechanisms to talk to other processes. Uh, but unlike OS processes, they are actually very lightweight. So on my laptop here, uh, I can run millions of processes and uh, everything will still be responsive. Um, some of you know this as the actor model of computing. So a process is created to handle the transport for that client. In this case, a WebSocket session. And for each channel that the client joins, uh, a process is also created. So those yellow circles is probably room lobby, or room one, or room two. You know, uh, if you join, if a channel joins two if a uh, client joins two topics, it will be res represented by two Erlang processors um, on the back end. Um, like an OS process, if a process crashes, it doesn't affect other processors. So you can imagine that uh, when a channel crashes a process, you did something weird there, access the database wrongly, didn't pass validation, or whatever, um, it crashes. Uh, but it wouldn't affect other channels or the original transport. Uh, a new, new process is simply spawned. So this is the model of computing uh, implied by the actor model, and it's incredibly fault tolerant. Now, if you're running one node, um, one server, my, my, my story is done here, but that's more exciting stuff. So if your web app is getting popular, you need to scale by adding more nodes. Right, there simply isn't enough CPU to handle the workload uh, that your, your, your startup is getting. Um, Phoenix ships with a pops up feature um, which is powered by distributed Erlang All right. um, that allows you to talk to other nodes and synchronize data. All right. So you can spin up 10, uh, you see a traffic spike, you can spin up like 10 nodes um, and they all can handle channels and they know how to talk to each other and forward messages accordingly um, with built-in tools only, with built-in features. Um, you can swap out uh, distributor Erlang uh, for Redis. I don't actually know anyone who has done it. <laughs> uh, that's how awesome this feature is. Um, Action Cable, which is inspired by Phoenix channels, uh, I don't know whether I'm getting ahead of myself, uh, has to be powered by Redis. Um, because they don't have distributed Erlang. So right here, I have explained how Erlang can do massively concurrent systems. And concurrent means 
you can easily scale it for performance, right? Horizontally scale. Uh, but it's also fault tolerance because a process crashing does not affect um, another process um, with 99, 99 reliability. Now, all this performance talk sounds theoretical, but has it been tested? Uh, when Phoenix 1.0 was released, someone suggested on the addition mailing list that they should really put their claims to the test. Um, not just micro benchmarks, but tests that can you know, put the framework under load and try to break it. So the Phoenix teams found the biggest server they could find. I think, yeah, it was 40 cores or something. And they set up a Phoenix channel, spun up a whole other army of servers to subscribe to just one topic. Um, and here's the result. So they started pushing load and clients joined at a rate of 20 to 25,000 clients per second. Uh, and that's across time. Right. And it steadily climbed and scaled all the way up to 2 million uh, plus connections. Now, the interesting thing is that that 2 million was actually a hard-coded cap uh, on the OS level because they weren't optimistic that, that you could even come close to uh, or, or 2 million. Uh, when they were configuring for, the, for this benchmark, they set it at, at 2 million. Um, but they could, could actually exceed 2 million and they think they could have kept going. Uh, and if you spin up HTOP, you can see that uh, it's a powerful machine, 40 cores, yes. Uh, you can see they are all idle now. Um, when they got to the 2 million connections, uh, they downloaded a Wikipedia article and they broadcast it to everyone. And everyone received that Wikipedia article within 2 to 3 seconds. And as he did that, they saw the CPU, CPU spike and the things were lighting up. Um, but then after that, everything just returned back to normal. Um, so that's channels. Yep. Um, maybe I talked a bit about too much about channels. Let's come back and talk about uh, what else Phoenix to go at. So back to stateless applications. Um, it's also really fast when it comes to normal HTTP requests, right? So here's another benchmark. Um, by the way, disclaimer: always take benchmarks with a pinch of salt, as always. You can see uh, Phoenix is handling more throughput and latency than everyone except Jin or Play. And it's not a fair comparison to Jin uh, because Jin is a micro framework, uh, while Phoenix is a full blown MVC framework, which also handles things like sessions out of the box. So the only full blown frameworks here are Rails and Play. And as for Play, it appears to be faster. It's also one of the most inconsistent, uh, if you see the rightmost column. Uh, not sure why, maybe the J JVM is doing funky things again. But the, the point that if you choose to believe this benchmark, um, Phoenix is the youngest framework here. So personally, I think it's pretty fast for the youngest framework. Uh, but that's just a little benchmark, right? Uh, this is a very famous, uh, they call it the poster boy article. Uh, Bleacher Report, um, a high traffic sports news site, uh, reduced 150 servers uh, to just five after migrating from Ruby and Rails to Phoenix. And they think they're over provisioned. Uh, you can read the article, the news clip yourself. Okay, enough about channels and performance. Uh, let's round up the talk a bit. Let's briefly talk about productivity. So Phoenix is not just about performance. In fact, as I mentioned earlier, the focus is on productivity over performance, uh, meaning uh, when they, if, they are tr if they ever encounter trade-offs where they choose between one or the two, uh, Chris will always pick productivity. And what I mean by productivity is uh, after you install Elixir, installation is really easy. Uh, just download uh, mixarchive.install and you can already create a new app. Uh, Um, if you are coming from Rails, this will look familiar. This is the router. Um, this is very easy to read because like Elixir, uh, well, like Ruby, Elixir has optional parentheses, so you can construct very readable um, DSLs. So you have helpers like resources, uh, which you can find in Rails too, that will generate all the CRUD routes for you. Uh, there's scope, which is new. Uh, that allows you to define a top-level path component and group related functions together, slash admin, for instance. But the scope also has another uh, purpose. Uh, I wish to call attention to the pipe through browser there. Uh, that means for all routes that belong to the scope, 
uh, apply the browser pipeline to it. So what, what's a pipeline? A pipeline is just a set of middleware you need to, wish to apply to just this set of routes. So you normally want to do very different things for different routes, right? Uh, for example, standard browser requests versus API requests. Uh, for browser requests, you typically want to fetch the session, protect against forgery. Um, and that's very, very different from, from an API request. Um, and this allows you to group middlewares to different routes and treat them very differently. At the same time, make it uh, very readable and maintainable. Uh, controllers. Um, again, if you're a Rails user, this you'll be familiar with. Um, the only difference is probably show, where there's pattern matching um, in params um, to extract the ID. There's also generators, um, in case you want to generate boilerplate really quickly. Um, in addition to generators, there's also tasks like uh, mix ecto migrate, you know, to, to, to migrate and, and generate migrations. Here, in my opinion, is one of Phoenix's um, killer features. Um, all views are functions. So what do I mean by that? Um, all views, uh, here is, here's uh, something called embedded elixir, EEX. Um, very similar to ERB in Ruby. And this um, template is actually compiled at build time into a function. And when I mean into a function, I really mean just another function. So thanks to Alicia's meta programming features, um, all your templates are compiled into functions, and when you deploy it and you run it, because they are functions, they're all loaded into memory at runtime and they are just uh, read off memory whenever a request comes in. So th that's one of the reasons why, and most people are shocked to find out that when they first spin up Phoenix, uh, the responses return within nanoseconds and not microseconds. And you heard me right, nanoseconds, um, because they don't need to do any disk I.O. Or, or any parsing, right? Uh, nothing needs to be read from this. Everything is just read from memory. You know, all that slow stuff uh, is out of the way uh, when views are just functions. Okay, so that's what you get out of uh, Phoenix. Uh, if, if you're not familiar with Elixir, there are other productivity boosts there. Uh, we have an amazing console in Movidian. It just gets better at every release. Um, they added breakpoints. There's a built-in help. They can just type, I, I almost never refer to the web documentation. I always try to tap and auto-complete in IX to, to discover documentation and how to use certain tools, uh, certain functions, sorry. Uh, there's also Observer, which allows you to inspect at runtime what processes are running. So all those are Erlang processes. Um, you can see the repo pool, and that's your database pool. Uh, I was completely soaked on this stack when I decided to queue one of the connections and it spun back up. Literally, like I couldn't see, I, can't smell. I thought I wasn't killing it. Uh, that's how um, fault tolerant Erlang is. You can see the pubs I mentioned earlier and all that. <coughs> so, uh, Eric MJ, the maintainer of Hex, uh, Hex is Alexius Package Manager, uh, not unlike uh, NPM for Node and uh, Ruby Gems uh, for, for the Ruby community, uh, kindly shared this data for me. Um, popularity wise, it's been growing exponentially since the start. Uh, it's at 3.6 million downloads now. Uh, Phoenix 1.0 was launched in August 2015, so a little bit in the first row, I guess. Um, and not showing any signs of slowing down. In fact, I, I think it's accelerating. Um, this is data all the way up to last January. Uh, not last January, um, the past January. Uh, and a little fun fact, uh, Phoenix is actually the second package ever published on Hex. Yeah. So I work for an e-commerce company called Bazaar, and we built our app from ground up in Elixir and Phoenix. So yes, although the stack is quite young, and you may not have heard of it, uh, we are using it in production now, and we are shipping Elixir code daily. So if any of these things excite you, and you want to work on bleeding edge web technologies every day, come and talk to me. So I'm done. Questions? So you said that you didn't use Linux or anything like that for distributed Erlang. So do you actually use distributed Erlang in your application today? 
Yeah, I'm using pubs up. I guess that counts, I guess. But do you use different nodes? Do I use different nodes? I have to communicate with each other. Well, Phoenix pubs up uses that underneath. So I would say I'm using it indirectly. I haven't directly used before. I did, oh, this is a good question. <laughs> Last week, I did have to uh, console into uh, production to debug something. And I used distributed Erlang to connect my IES console into the, the running node uh, and, and set breakpoints on it, which is insane, actually. It's the first time I'm doing it. So that counts as distributed Erlang. Uh, but your uh, main deploy is a big server, like one big uh, license. No, it wasn't a business. It was okay. it was across IPs. Okay. Yeah. Because I tried it. Like uh, the the deploy is pretty uh, complicated because you need like to register all the different instances. Yep. And uh, yep. So, so with if okay, you know, it's not possible. Like we use a router. Then. So I'll, I'll plug another product here. Uh, I'm using Nanobox as mentioned. Yep. And all that is taken care of. You just have to do node attach, uh, yeah, and it can find the other node. Awesome. Just like that. Yeah. Yeah. So so uh, Nanobox spins up a private like VPN thing, so you won't get traffic. Uh, that was the issue people have because it's not secure if you can just connect to any node, right? So um, within within that subnet um, net, um, they they help you set all the cookies and all the settings. Yep. Uh, Phoenix is uh, kind of new. I mean, it's been a few years, but you still run into a, a situation where you might not have certain libraries. Yeah, um, it's, it's my primary week right now. <laughs> yeah, so what, do you, what exactly do you do? I, I heard that you could fall back to Alarm, but uh, uh, I think Alarm packages are also having their own issues. So, what do you actually do in that situation? Okay, so the question is um, if the ecosystem is weak, what do you do? Um, I don't have a good answer because it's my primary problem. <laughs> um, but what I found is uh, because Elixir is so easy to code in, um, I could really quickly spin up like uh, roughly just what I need. Uh, moreover, uh, it's very, very similar to uh, like syntax-wise to Ruby. So there was once or twice where I actually looked up a Ruby library, found out how they did it and just rewrote it in Elixir. <laughs> yeah. Um, for example, a Slugify library, which you can find, uh, was I, I, I looked through a lot of Ruby libraries for that. Have you open sourced that? Yes. So the Slugify library is open source. I'm going to open source in another library soon. Uh, just stay tuned. <laughs> yep. You could post that library on the slide. Yep. Okay. there been that much investment in the Erlang VM these days? Yes, and the second question is basically uh, when, when something is for CP block processing, uh, I don't know if Conrad wants to answer in the community, so uh, I've heard Erlang is not that great, so people sometimes resort to doing a native yep. interface. Sounds good. Yep. Okay, so to answer the first question first, um, if you follow the Erlang repo, it is, there's a lot of development going through it, so I'm not sure why you mean that. <laughs> what you mean when you said uh, not heavily invested? Um, I know a lot of investment banks. I will name them. Uh, it's critical to their production, so they uh, they they just can't uh, abandon the platform. There's no way, <laughs> right? 
Uh, like I said, half of the world's telecom runs in Erlang. Um, you don't deprecate a language just like that uh, when it's so widely used. Uh, so I wouldn't be too worried about uh, language development in the sense that uh, it's uh, going to be abandoned or anything like that. But maybe you will be worried that uh, development's a bit slow. Um, but they have to, right? It's, it's so mature and so better tested and so proven. Like you can't just change things too much, right? So, um, but surprisingly, um, thanks to Elixir coming on board, uh, Elixir is bringing that developer mindset from Ruby, right? Uh, Jose himself and, and a lot of people uh, from the, the, the Elixir hipsters, they call, uh, is adding a lot of changes back into and contributing a lot of changes back to Erlang, you know? Uh, for example, UTF-8 atoms and that sort of thing. So we are seeing pace actually picking up uh, on OTP actually, uh, Erlang OTP. Uh, to answer the second question, uh, Erlang DM is not exactly great for CPU bound work. Uh, I've shown you um, things like 2 million connections. Uh, those are not CPU bound, those are IO bound work. And, and that is correct. Um, the beam is actually optimized for uh, low latency uh, and very quick responses. Uh, the the scheduler is uh, very, very preemptive and very aggressive on top of that. Uh, if you spend a little bit too many CPU cycles, they call it reductions. If you spend more than 2,000 reductions, it just shuts you, asks you to shut up and it will just uh, give that CPU cycles to another processor. So the right tool for the right job, right? Um, if you're trying to do CPU bound work, like a game engine, please don't write it in Erlang. You know? um, Erlang is, uh, is great for doing uh, what I think the modern web needs now. Right. You want very fast, uh, very quick responses, like fast latency. Um, and whenever you need uh, CPU bound work, you most of the time, if not all of the time, you'll farm it out to a background process. Now that background process can be managed by Erlang, but the actual computation uh, can be done in another language. Like uh, these days, Rust uh, is quite popular in the Alicia community. You know? And you want to do this background process even maybe outside the server that you're running Elixir on, right? So that they won't fight for CPU cycles. So you can continue to serve, uh, you know, uh, those responses quickly, um, and then you know, uh, and asynchronize all the CPU bound work, uh, and give it to languages uh, uh, who are better suited. And the thing is, almost every language is uh, tuned, other than Ruby <laughs> and Python, is tuned for CPU performance, right? Like C, Rust, you know. Um, we have those languages doing that already. Uh, why not a language um, optimized for latency? And to me, I think the biggest computing problem is actually serving web pages. <laughs> you know, why is there no languages that are optimized for latency? Uh, oh, thank, thank goodness there's Erlang and uh, Elixir now. You know. Yeah, just to add on your point. I mean, for, for Erlang, why, why people say that there's low latency is because the GC is actually done on the process itself. And everything that is within that process, that very lightweight process, right? Once the process dies, everything is collected, GC immediately. So it's many, many, many small GC versus like Java, JPM, right? It's one big GC, they go through all the generations and pick it up and GC all the stuff. But yeah. for Erlang, it's that process immediately throw away a whole chunk and it's done. Yeah, because no memory is shared, right? Yeah. So when you know the process is done, you can just kill that memory. You know, yeah. uh, you don't need to stop the world. We call it the stop the world garbage collection. Uh, and, that, and that's why you sometimes you screw an Android too fast. You know, you, you get jitters. Um, anyway, if there's a language that was designed from day one to be on the back end, uh, it would be Erlang. You know, uh, like Java was originally designed for like smart TVs. You know, and now it's the biggest server side language. Not, yeah, so because of a side language, it is. Uh, Ruby was just a little shell scripting tool, and, and now, you know, but you know, Rails is, is number one uh, used now. You know? uh, but here, we, we have a back end language designed from back end from day one. <laughs> uh, yeah, you know. Yes? Uh, how do you get started with the uh, And what resources would you recommend? Are you saying how or? How do you, if you want to get started, what should you do? And what do you get started? Okay, so um, I think it's quite interesting story actually. 
So uh, I, was, I was building this project, uh, it was an MVP and we did it in Rails because it was the fastest. Um, but then when we, the, the MVP was successful and when we wanted to, to take it further, um, someone in my co-working space just suggested, oh, have you looked into Elixir? And we're like, uh, what's, what's Elixir? <laughs> right? Or have you looked into Phoenix? Oh, I don't know what's Phoenix. So I actually decided to watch Phoenix videos before I even knew what Elixir was. I, I didn't really care about what Elixir was. I thought, hey, this channels thing is really cool. This real-time stuff is really cool. It's exactly what I need you know, for what I'm trying to do. All those problems I faced building MVP could be solved with Phoenix, you know. It was only after that, that digging into Phoenix, that I discovered how, how awesome uh, Elixir is and by extension, how awesome Erlang is. Uh, so that's how I got started. All right, uh, how do you get started? Um, there's a very famous guy called Dave Thomas who sort of introduced Ruby to the masses. He wrote a book called Programming Ruby. Uh, he happens to like Elixir just as much. Um, and he wrote a book called Programming Elixir uh, by Dave Thomas. So look that book up. Uh, I learned Elixir using that book. Uh, but if you don't want, you want something faster with more tutorials, the official guides on elixirlang.org, uh, elixir-lang.org are really, really, really good. Uh, to onboard new people uh, to, to my company, I, I normally ask them to try Elixir Cohen's. Yes, uh, there's a Cohen's for Elixir as well. Uh, so there's, those are three very different ways. Some like reading books, some like you know, just learning prompt from your editor. That's three choices right there. Um, for learning Phoenix though, uh, I still think the official book is the only and the best way. Uh, unfortunately, it's extremely outdated now because <laughs> Chris doesn't have time. Uh, they change a lot of things between the current version of Phoenix and the last Phoenix. Uh, we are at 1.3 now. Uh, the book is for 1.2. Uh, the book is projected to be completed in the middle of this year, and, but no guarantees because it was projected to be completed in the middle of last year. Uh, the best thing you can do, uh, because they change a lot of things around, is to actually jump on Elixir. Read the book, but jump on Elixir Slack, where I hang out all the time and ask questions there. Uh, Elixir community is one of the best I've ever met. Uh, they are all very, very helpful, which is ridiculous. <laughs> Yeah, bonus slide. So uh, that's the CD man that I mentioned by Nokia Mobira. Um, it's actually released in 1987, uh, which is one year after Erlang came out. So Erlang predates this phone even. All right, thank you. Thanks a lot. <laughs>